Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Zing. Today, I would like to speak on the difficulties faced during the caregiving of my dad, who is living with frontal temporal dementia. I chose the theme of a clock as the background because time waits for no one, especially for people like my dad. Their cognitive function declines as time passes by, and I hope that my sharing today will bring more awareness. I also hope that the society will be able to understand and integrate them better as an individual. My dad is 58 this year and was diagnosed with frontal temporal dementia since he was 53. It was an age that no one in the family would have expected dementia to strike. My dad has always been driving and owns a class 2 to class 5 license. During the days when he drove a taxi, his relief driver told him to play with stocks to earn quick money. As research was not done, he lost a substantial amount of money and he was depressed for a long period of time. He generally led a sedentary lifestyle and loves to watch TV programs, which is an activity that does not serve to build up any cognitive function. Since he was driving from places to places, he tends to eat out frequently and consume food that is laden with MSG. The Straits Times published an article on 28 July 2017 stating that Indians are less likely to suffer from dementia than Chinese. They attributed it, this to the high consumption of turmeric by Indians, which is rich in antioxidants and has anti-inflammatory effects. My dad has been buying 4D and Toto for almost 40 years of his life. One would actually expect that he will continue to do so for the rest of his life. However, overnight, he stopped gambling. He started saving to an extreme extent overnight. This included cutting off my brother's and my pocket money without warning. We were still schooling then. He even added a timer to the refrigerator so that it will turn off and on every few hours in order to save electricity. There were frequent arguments between my parents over air conditioner as turning on the air conditioner would mean that there will be an increase in an electricity bill. It was tension every day at home. I started suspecting that he might have dementia after he left the main door open on numerous occasions. One would come home from home or school at 11 p.m. to find the main door wide open. On top of that, he started to have poor judgment in his driving and got into minor accidents frequently. Searching for keys around the house in the morning became a norm. As his condition deteriorated, there were more and more difficulties faced by the family. There are definitely much more difficulties that we have faced, but I would like to focus on the above. There were occasions where he would threaten to jump. There was, an, there was this episode where he was shaking the window grills of the living room and the master bedroom. It was very, very scary to watch. He always wanted to work and he was very unhappy that he was not allowed to do so. We could not allow him to be on the road for the safety of the public. Days after we filed for LTA to revoke his license, a prime mover killed two boys on the road. The driver could have been my dad. The family really do not wish to be living in guilt for the rest of their lives if this will happen. He will flare his tantrums when he does not know what is going on or if things are not going according to his wishes. When he is at home, he wants to go out. But when he is outside, he wants to go home. It was very difficult acceding to all his requests. There was an occasion where we traveled all the way to Jurong Park Park and the minute that we reached there, he wanted to go home. I almost cried out in tears. Time was definitely an issue for him. Whenever he takes a nap, he will register it as a new day when he wakes up. He will end up in a series of tantrums, claiming that we locked him at home, preventing him from going out. We had never prevented him from leaving, and he even had his own bunch of house keys. However, due to insecurities, he wants my mom to bring him out. My poor mom, who had just brought him back an hour ago, barely got the rest and has to deal with him again. 
There was also a day which he went out at 3 a.m. with a pair of scissors, wanting to take revenge on the company that had fired him. My mom got really worried to find him missing in the middle of the night. Luckily, he came back safe and sound because he forgot to bring his Ezelink card. <laughs> we do not know whether we should laugh or cry. <laughs> On hallucinations, he will claim that someone is instigating him to take revenge on the company that had fired him. The doctors had to put him on extra medication. Every time he does his big business in the toilet, there will be a lot of fuss and tantrum. He'll be saying things like, if I have to shit after I eat, why do I eat in the first place? It sounded logical, but it was a hard time explaining things to him. And in fact, he got hospitalized on a few occasions for losing his temper over this issue. We had to get the doctors to explain to him that passing motion is normal and it was really shitty. <laughs> Okay, there are six different activities of daily living. I would like to emphasize the four ADLs that my dad had trouble with. He was stuffing food in his mouth like a chipmunk. So on some occasion, he would have a gag reflex, but that does not stop him from stuffing more food into his mouth. We are very afraid that he will choke on his food one day. When he bathes himself, the top of the hair will be wet, but the inside will be dry. He does not soak himself properly and often complains of itchiness of his scalp and skin. On certain days that he's in a bad mood, he does not want to bathe. We had to sponge him with a towel to minimize body odor. He was unable to clean after himself, especially after the big business. There will be feces found on his underwear. On some days when he bathes by himself, he will urinate on the floor of the toilet. The whole toilet will read of urine spell, but when we ask him about it, he actually denies it. On dressing, he will usually wear clothes in the wrong orientation for both his tops and bottom. Anger was one of the first emotions portrayed within the family. We had a notion that he was doing things on purpose in order to spite us. We didn't know what he was going through. Most importantly, we didn't know how to deal with him. Anger was also displayed because he had cut off the household expenses and pocket money when we needed it. So, why should we take care of you just because we are sick? That was actually the big why that formed within the family. Eventually, we took over the caregiving role at it, as he became more and more dependent. After all, he was the dad that gave life to me. It is definitely my responsibility to take care of him. It is not easy trying to juggle two jobs and making sure that everything runs well within the family. There were times when I'm working in school and my mom would text me, your dad is having an episode again, what should I do? To be honest, I never knew how to deal with all his episodes. It was never easy. I just settled whatever issues that comes my way. With the addition of messages like this, I feel frustrated by the inability to handle things and helplessness to be stuck in school without being able to do anything. There is always persistent fear that he might have an episode anytime and any of the family member could get hurt due to his violent tendencies. As such, I live in constant worries and anxiety each day. When I'm at work, I'm worried if he will have another episode. This leads to a chain of worries because I will be worried if my mom can calm him down or if my mom will be hurt by him. I also worry about his suicidal tendency. It was worries after worries. I don't know if you call me resourceful or kiasu, but I did manage to pull a lot of support from different organizations. The actual list is much longer than this. Some are referrals from the main medical institution, but others are angels sent from heaven. I do not want to bore you by reading out all the names, but rather by listing out the names here, I would want to tell all caregivers out there, yes, the role of caregiving may be tough, but we are lucky to be born in Singapore. Help is within reach, and except for daycare services, the family did not have to fork out money to be receiving professional advices and counselling. I tried to gain more knowledge on dementia by reading out the internet and borrowing books from the library. On occasions that we cannot cope with his behaviour, we would call up the social worker to seek more advice on the subsequent actions. 
through the time that we have been in Him, we are able to preempt His actions through His body language and responsive behaviors. My mom would then use some distraction techniques or try to coax him outdoor in order to calm him down so that his attention will be deflected. On episodes that we are unable to cope, we will have to involve the police and the medic. The family went through difficulties while claiming for his DPS insurance. Since my dad does not have an LPA and was assessed to be not having mental capacity, a court-appointed deputy has to be done. The cost involved lawyer fees, medical and psychological report. A lot of time was also required to gather the necessary documents. I would strongly urge all of you out here that whoever has not set up an LPA, please do so as soon as possible to prevent going through what the family has went through. For more information, you might want to refer to the Office of Public Guardian website. As his number of episodes increases, with two major episodes occurring that requires the involvement of the police and medic within a month, we raised white flags. I was very worried for my mom's mental health and was worried that she might suffer from depression. We found ourselves tearing every few days from frustration and helplessness. That was when I decided that enough was enough. Moreover, I was suffering from anxiety attacks in the night. It was definitely taking a toll on the family's mental health. We no longer want to live in a life filled with fear that he will be jumping off the building anytime. It took us some time before we came to this difficult decision of sending him to a nursing home. The guilt was eating us out. There may be people out there that might label me as unfilial, but I truly had no choice. I could say that I had tried my best. These four years were indeed a big struggle for the family. During my university days, the family was in pieces. On one to two occasions, my dad did feedback to me before that he was bullied at his workplace. I did not listen to him, neither did I show him much concern. I knew that he was bullied partly because he was looking down on his fellow colleagues as he was earning more than them. It may also have been attributed to the resentment that I had in him for losing money to gambling and for cutting out all forms of allowance for two schooling teenagers. Life was pretty much a struggle for four of us. Maybe, maybe, if I could be a little bit more empathetic then, things might not have been the same. After his formal diagnosis, I was very frustrated and tired of his frequent erratic and stubborn behavior. I hate to admit it, but I did yell at him. I thought he was doing everything on purpose to spite us. I never knew what he was going through, and I really should have managed my emotions better. There were also times when we discussed his condition and his behavior in front of the doctor. We should have been more mindful of what we have said. We only took precautions during the late part of the diagnosis as he was getting increasingly unhappy with us. We usually have a lot of issue. We usually have a lot of issue engaging my dad during the weekends because daycare centers usually operates from Monday to Friday to cater to the working population. It was the same issue for senior activity centers and helplines. We had little avenues for him to expand his energy or to seek help. As dementia becomes more and more prevalent, I think there is a need to start providing more weekend services to alleviate the burden from the caregivers. We should also organize more similar campaigns and talks to raise the awareness so as to detect dementia early and hopefully the existing medications on the market can help to control the progress of the diagnosis. Social stigma exists, sadly to say, including myself, that whenever we see someone behaving differently, we will tend to shun them instead of helping them. The society definitely has to be more cohesive to help poor souls like them. After all, not everyone is fortunate to have around-the-clock caregiving. There are a few people that I must thank. First and foremost, I would like to thank Jake Mui from being with us since the week that my dad was diagnosed with dementia. And Jake Mui is here. So thank you for the kind words and the patience that you have given me over these five years. 
Thank you for hearing me out and being so meticulous and professional in whatever you do. Next, I would like to thank Michelle and Jesu for taking time to do monthly home visits and for being there to listen whenever I need you. I would also like to thank Albert of Bishan Comcare, who always invite my parents for any activities organized by Bishan Community Club or Bishan RC. Last but not least, I would like to thank the family who are here today and friends for being my pillar of support whenever I need them. Thank you. Okay, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tan Tia Mei. Yeah, so um, today I'm here to share my dad's story. Um, actually, I am from a healthcare background, so to me, um, it was slightly cushion journey. Yeah, but still, um, yeah, still I think there were some struggles. So um, I'll just start my sharing today. Okay, um, if it comes early. Okay, so for my dad, actually, um, he was diagnosed when he was 58. Uh, back then, he was still working. Um, he's actually working as a machinist. So he was in the factory and they had to deal with machines that actually cut out like parts of the gear. Um, and then he was a supervisor then. Um, when it happened, in, uh, he was only 58 years old. Um, and then uh, he was in the mild stage when he was from 59 to 62. And currently, he's in the moderate stage. Okay, so the discovery did not come very easy because my dad actually was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's is actually slow and progressive and the things come very subtly. So for us, uh, it was really a lot of... Um, the guilt happened earlier on because um, we were thinking like some of these clues were really quite subtle. One of the clues that was that um, because part of... Um, my culture, like in our religion, we actually have to do some um, sharings, like moral teachings. And so um, there were feedback from aunties and uncles that they're telling me that he was doing sharing in class, but he was no longer writing as much notes on the board. Uh, and actually, um, my favorite part of him was his handwriting. His handwriting was really beautiful and his signature as well. But uh, we noticed that his handwriting became less legible um, as the time went by. Okay, then there was also a time that uh, it was quite... So we thought he was having a new hobby because he started playing a lot of Sudoku. Yeah, then every night at home, he would be very conscientiously doing Sudoku and we were just, okay, yeah, you know, uh, he's having a new hobby. But then um, occasionally when I stopped by there, I realized that he, I think he's having some difficulties with it. Yeah, and that was it. Okay, and uh, one of his role in the home is actually to be the morning alarm clock. He'll be the one who wakes up the whole family. Um, then how we sort of confirm is that he stopped being the morning alarm clock because he started waking up later and later. And we had to be the ones who wake up uh, and start the morning routine instead. Um, and in 2012, we actually went for a, a, a sort of like a religious trip. And then uh, it was during then that also again, the auntie and uncles in the community, then they were uh, telling us that, hey, your dad is having a longer time changing in and out of his clothes. Yeah, so they were just concerned. So all the signs actually came very subtly um, and it wasn't really obvious. Okay, so when all these signs actually um, appeared, and of course, being the healthcare professional, and I have been studying for dementia things for quite a number of years, yeah, so um, I was uh, thinking really hard, you know, is this really dementia or is it age-related forgetfulness? Yeah, but after um, having some discussions, and then we also discovered that um, he was, my mom discovered he was hiding a lot of money around the house, and then he started engaging in some uh, weird transactions, like he, uh, at his workplace, somebody approached him for some donations, and he actually donated to them, and it was quite a huge sum of money, and we were like, eh, hey, why does he do that? Yeah, so when more and more of such incidents happened, then we realised that there might be something going on. Yeah. So, but preparing for the first doctor visit is actually quite difficult. Yeah, because... Um, uh, whenever we broach the subject to him, he will say that, oh, I'm normal, what? I have nothing wrong. Why do I need to go and see a doctor? Okay, so um, we also didn't want to hurt his pride because he had been the family breadwinner for X number of years. Yeah, so we decided to, okay, um, I was, one day and I was really at a loss, I decided to call the ADA helpline. Yeah, because I heard that it operates 24 hours, so I just give it a try. So <laughs> after what I gave it a call, I was like, hey, uh, actually, I need to check um, how should I broach the topic to my dad. So thankfully, they gave me some advice. And then um, 
uh, we came over the phone, the counselor with me came to a conclusion. I should just tell him that um, it's a free checkup. Yeah, and then uh, let's try to see whether we can bring him there. Okay, then the next difficult part in the early stage is actually getting him to quit his job. Yeah, because uh, he has a lot of pride in his work. Yeah, so um, getting to find out that he was really um, suspecting that he was having problems in his job was one thing. Confirming that he really had problems was another thing. So how I really confirmed before I spoke to him was that there was one day that I was not working on a Saturday and I decided to visit his workplace. Yeah, so I just, because uh, he usually cycles to work. Yeah. He cycles to work, so that's why uh, I decided to, okay, maybe today I'm not working. Can I just uh, follow you to your workplace? Because I've been, like, so, I'm so old already, but I still don't know how your workplace looks like. Thankfully, he allowed me to go. And when I went there, I found out that, oh my God, what has he been doing? I saw the records. He, as a supervisor, he was supposed to make some records in the record book. But the writing was ter terrible. I cannot read. Yeah, and then um, I saw him telling me about the machines at his workplace, and then I realized that, um, yeah, okay, I think he sort of knows it, but some parts he couldn't tell me in detail, so I noticed that something is seriously wrong. And then when I waited for him to walk away a bit, and then I asked the other people in his office, how has he been at work? Because we heard that sometimes at lunch he's not eating, and then the colleague confirmed by telling me that um, they have been buying lunch for him, because if they don't buy lunch for him, he probably not eat. So that was my red flag, and I decided to, okay, so with enough evidence, I better check him with the doctor. Okay, so when we had him checked out at the doctor, so we got the terrible news, it was confirmed that he really had dementia. Um, and then so being a therapist myself, I was like, okay, come, let's get him started on some therapy. So um, in the first part, um, we actually wanted him to just get some cognitive engagement because we stopped him from working and he sort of forced into retirement. So instead of getting him depressed every day about it, we wanted him to be engaged in something and also to practice a lot more skills because Sudoku is really too hard. So if he, can, he can't do it, there must be other things that he can do. Okay, so we started because we were diagnosed in the Tan Tock Seng Clinic. So we went on to the Tan Tock Seng Memory Program. So this is a program that actually helps um, the new diagnosed patients to get started. So it tries to simulate a daycare because back then I only knew daycare, but I know that he wouldn't reach there yet. Yeah, so thankfully there was an intermediate program. So they had three hours of um, activities. Then there were like OT, PT, ST, different therapies going in to try to engage within that three hours. Yeah, and it was during the time that I realized that the first person to convince that dementia is a problem is actually my mom. Yeah, so I had to let her understand what is dementia first. Is it really as terrible? Because her own mom had dementia, but her own mom had dementia when she was 80 plus. So a 80 plus having a dementia is quite different from a 50 plus getting a dementia. So she had to first understand um, what was the dementia and what was the impact and how this would change her life. So uh, thankfully there was this intermediate program um, that she could bring him to and she can talk to other family members and have a better understanding of it herself. Okay, then of course um, in the mild stage, yeah, then uh, we started to have, so like I mentioned just now, some of the finances was that uh, he had very weird um, donations and investments and weird policies that he bought. Yeah, so, uh, and he was hiding money quite a lot. We also have to sort out all the bills and insurance because he used to be the one who is paying for them, uh, even though I was working. Yeah, so he was paying for it. Then so when we had to take over all this, then we realized that, oh, you know, he had been having some problems, but they weren't apparent because he was keeping them from us. Okay, then in the mouse stage, there was never ending breakfast as well because he started to forget that he has eaten. Yeah, and whatever you put on the table, then sometimes at night, he'll wake up, he'll finish everything off. Yeah, and then of course, there were also dental concerns. Because the mouse stage lasted a few years, then he didn't regularly check his teeth, so there were some teeth problems. Okay, and throwing things away was very difficult. So, um, because uh, he actually, he's quite a hobbyist, he collected quite a number of things. Um, he liked a lot of music, so he had a lot of uh, LDs, DVDs, VCDs, etc. And then, um, some of these things, uh, along with his work stuff, was not was taking up really a lot of space. And so we wanted to 
um, make the place uh, simpler so that he can still take out some of his things and you know um, engage with them. Yeah, but throwing things away was a no-no. So even when there was a non-relevant thing at home, um, he also didn't allow us to throw away. So later I'll share a strategy that was very useful. Okay, and unfortunately for him, he also had a complication. So he had sleep apnea. So he needed to be put on a sleeping mask. And even at the mild stage, he will refuse to put on a mask because uh, he will think that when he will wake up and he will forget, he will be like, what is this doing here? Then throw away. But when he doesn't do that, when we did the sleep study, he actually wakes up 21 times per night. Yeah, so that is very poor quality of sleep. Yeah, so that was something we had to struggle with. Okay, and of course, uh, throughout this process, um, I think my dear mom was very stressed because she can't understand what's going on. Yeah, so I have to try hard to find a counsellor for her. Okay, so uh, it was at this point in time that we got into ADA. Yeah, and the Family of Wisdom program is really a good program because uh, when we were told uh, it was actually supposed to be for mild dementia only, but as my dad progressed to a moderate stage, he's still in the program, so I'm really thankful for them. Okay, so um, for him, uh, thankfully, he actually has a lot of uh, interest and he's quite an easygoing guy. So um, unlike frontal lobe dementias, which tend to have a lot of behavioral issues, Alzheimer's is more mild and they'll end up staring blankly into space uh, than anything else. Yeah, so, uh, but he's quite engageable. Like, if I try him on any activity, he will do, so it's okay. Yeah. But it also had a lot of uh, programs that were, uh, created a lot of memories for us. So like, there was outings to some destinations like Gardens by the Bay, the airport, the museum, and then there was photography club that actually brought them to take pictures. So we were given a book with how my dad was taking pictures and some of his pictures. Uh, so they were still nice. Yeah. And then uh, he was also given a chance to perform at one of the ADA balls. Yeah. And also, um, this program is good because uh, the patients had something to do, and then the caregivers, which is all the moms, had a place to wine together. And it was really important for them to talk about their men. Okay, but in the mom stage, is uh, the best time to do a lot of family time. So, like, uh, he used to do cycling, so this one gave me a heart attack, you know. <laughs> Luckily, I'm a therapist. So I tried him on cycling, and then uh, I really prayed hard before I try. But the thing with Alzheimer's is that like with cycling and also badminton, although he hasn't done it for a long time since he was diagnosed, um, the first time that he tries, he will get a bit shaky. The second time that he tries, he actually recalls how to do it. Yeah. So if um, you know anyone who actually has Alzheimer's and uh, you think that they might want to try interest, it's actually okay to try as long as uh, you are ready to try. Yeah, because it is possible to get them to re-engage again. Okay, so I also had basketball sessions with him. Yeah, badminton. Yeah, and a lot of uh, family dinners. Yeah, then we went to uh, some uh, 3D, 3D museum. Yeah. And then we also got him to help us uh, paint our room. Okay, so currently he's in the moderate stage. So the difficulties that we face uh, is a bit more challenging because currently it will affect a lot more of his self-care. So if leave him to himself, he will not be able to manage himself in the toilet or shower. So these are the things that we needed to start uh, struggling with. And also to, at the same time, I will have to convince my mom that yes, he's having problems. Please go and help him. Don't be shy, just go. Okay, and also um, continence issues because uh, he will start to lose his continence. And then um, there was an episode last year that we found blood in his tools. And then we were struggling with, so uh, is it uh, just pulse you know, or is it something else? But as a, he cannot be the most compliant patient because he wouldn't tell us where's the pain. And he's very scared of ticklish, so the <laughs> dear doctors cannot get a proper assessment of him. Yeah, so that takes a lot of guessing on our part. Since he can't tell us, we have to guess. Okay, and sleep at me as well. Yeah. And this was when some of the agitation start to set in because he does feel sad and he knows what's going on. So starting from the mild stage, he already knows that he's losing his abilities. But in the moderate stage, um, it's no longer when he can problem solve. So he'll wake up to the problem, but he'll not know what to do with it. Okay, so at this stage, uh, when he actually progressed on, we did try to, because initially we were told uh, the program only fits mild dementia, so we tried to look for alternative. Yeah, but when we went to visit the daycare, then uh, thankfully for him, 
he's actually the type of dementia that can, the talking abilities is preserved, so he can still talk and sing, yeah, but he just can't do all the things that you want him to do. So he can't write, he can't sign, but he can still talk, he can still sing. So we could put him into a social day care for respite for my mum. And we got him there on the pretext that he was going to help the other elderly. Okay, so I will just quickly skip Okay, stop, yeah. So sorry, because I'm running out of time already. Okay, so I'll just uh, stop on this slide. So what helped was um, one of the strategy was out of sight, one out of mind. So when we really had to tidy up the house, uh, but we didn't want him to feel very sad that he was losing all his belongings, uh, we had to try to get him out of the house before we can do anything to the house. Yeah, so that was useful. And it also helped that he has a lot of rich life experiences and he's open to new experience. So we could do a lot of things with him. Yeah, and... Yeah, and ADA has really has a lot of support services, which I'm very thankful for. Yeah, so um, for any other questions, I think you can ask during the Q&A later. Yeah, thank you. Do we have any questions from the floor at this point for the two ladies, the two care partners? Any, po any questions? If not, uh, okay, I'll tell you what. Um, maybe I would ask you the resources. Right, I think, Chami, um, both of you spoke a little bit about it. Do you think there are enough? Do you think more can be done? Was it difficult to find the resources, in your opinion? Maybe we can start with you, Jin. Okay, like I, what I highlighted in my presentation, resources was definitely available, but it was difficult to find resources during the weekends. Because, I mean, all the helplines run by office hour, all the senior activity centre, daycare, they run by office hour. So Monday to Friday, I have no issue finding resources, but Saturday and Sunday, that's when all the tantrum begins because we have no activities for him and he does not have any hobbies. Okay. 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 For me, um, because I am a healthcare professional myself, so I know a lot of resources. So I was just thinking like for people who are not, that it might be a bit more difficult because there isn't a centralised website that tells all the things like where can you go to. So like even in a hospital when we have to tell them, we'll, most of the time, we'll just say those that we know and the new services will be something that we are not so aware. And of course, like um, what she mentioned, the 24-hour supervision kind of things, uh, it will be quite difficult. Yeah, and knowing that there are services out there is one thing. Trying to get the family member to agree and go, that's the second thing that's quite difficult as well. Now, both of you uh, also mentioned that your, your fathers had to stop work at uh, some point of the diagnosis. Yes. Earlier this morning, we, we did speak about independence. We did speak about how we can continue to lead a, a full life. Well, sometimes it's possible, sometimes it may not be. Uh, would, 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 you know, with retrospect, would, would any other accommodation be possible other than stopping? Well, I, I know your dad because he, he was driving. Yes. That was incredibly difficult. Yes, that's correct. Um, basically, he lost tantrums in the house often because we had to force him to stop driving. Like I say, it's because of the public safety, we have to force him to stop. So, but the thing is, he's not interested in anything. He will turn on the TV for three seconds and turn it off. <laughs> I have not even watched the advertisement yet. <laughs> then, um, when we try to bring him to daycare centre, he escapes from it. <laughs> So when we try to bring him to things here and there, if he doesn't like, he wants to go home. So it's quite difficult to manage him. I think it depends on uh, which type of dementia also and uh, the job. So like for my dad, he, it wasn't possible if he didn't stop because he was using machines to cut out metal parts. And that whole process itself is actually quite dangerous. And also for him, um, his motor was more affected. So he could think of what he wanted to do and he can tell you this is what I'm going to do, but I can't. Yeah, so if he can't do what he's meant to do, then it's very hard to work. And, and, and both of you have, have gone through a, a, a period of time, right? Yes. This is not, not new. Yes. If you could take us sort of back a few years, would you have any advice for anybody in the audience who might be sort of just maybe starting to experience this? Find more social groups. <laughs> Find more helps and talk to as many people as you can. So usually if you lock everything inside your mind, first thing, you might not find a solution. Second thing, I don't know whether you suffer from depression. <laughs> and thirdly, if you talk to people, um, first thing, it can open up your roots to different support groups. Like 
organization A can say that, oh, you know, we might have activities in organization B. Organization B say, hey, we have activities in organization C. It actually will help a lot. I actually started with one to two organization and I ended up with almost six, seven, eight. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. Actually, I agree a lot as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, my question here says, um, you know, how, how did you feel when you first got the initial diagnosis? Actually, I kind of expected it from his behavior. Right. So I was just waiting for the final diagnosis by the doctor because I suspected it. I told my mom, we had to bring him to Tan Tok Sing. Um, this won't do. So lucky he was fired, maybe. Yeah. So we brought him to Tan Tok Sing and he got diagnosed. Um, to be honest, I think I took it better than him because he was really upset that he could not work. And he blames the family for bringing him to Tan Tok Sing to get the diagnosis that does not allow him to work. Uh, Jin, you mentioned that he, he's now in a day, nursing care, yes. nursing home. Uh, has that, in your opinion, um, helped the situation? Um, it was definitely helpful. In the past, we have to live with all his tantrums. We are frustrated. We are actually on tender hooks every day. We are afraid that he will do this. We are afraid that he punch us, uh, destroy the furniture. Uh, there's a lot of things that he has done. And we are afraid that it will get worse because he's frontal... Temp uh, temporal dementia um, but for now he's in the nursing home he's he actually got dementia for five years only he has progressed to the final stage he's currently on diapers he stutters a lot he cannot form a proper sentence um, yeah it's I mean it's normal for frontal lobe dementia to progress so fast but I don't know I think it's more zen for us in the family not to be you know seeing him um, with his face around I mean it's quite scary I understand. And uh, tell me, how are you preparing for the future? You, you, you've mentioned it's a, sort of a, a moderate stage right now. Mm, actually, I think currently, because I think as a young, uh, as a family, family member of somebody with young onset, uh, what caught us unprepared was that suddenly, uh, before retirement, we have to take care of his retirement. Yeah, so um, currently, I think uh, the retirement part we have settled already, but it's more of preparing my mum for her loss of her spouse in future. Yeah, and how she will gradually take it because I think she's quite responsible. She wants to be able to be there all the time instead of getting a maid. Yeah, so um, it will be more of that kind of preparation now. So, so speak to me about that because then my next question would have been about your, your mother's, right? Yeah. Uh, how has um, the dementia affected uh, them and their lifestyle, how they're like? Um. I think my mom has become stronger and became more independent. Whenever I go out with her, she does not know her way. But when she goes out alone with my dad, she will be forced to ask around and ask for direction. So before my dad has dementia, she cannot take the MRT herself. <laughs> but after my dad got dementia, she you know, learned to navigate around without my help because I need to work. So um, there are periods that she broke down in tears, that she's sad, she's helpless, that she cannot care for him, that she has to send him to a nursing home. But I can say that she has become much stronger than what it was. I think for my mom, it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of change because she used to be the Xiao Niren, like very gentle one. Then after that, since my dad became more passive, the balance was tipped over. So she has to be the one that's telling him what to do. And then I have to ask him, uh, I have to ask, tell her to, Mom, don't scold dad so much, you know, because sometimes her verbal cues sound very strict. Yeah, so <laughs> she has become a fiercer lady after that. Yeah, but I think also um, she has, as she uh, go along, she can become more zen as well because uh, she will be the one that's telling my sis, hey, don't put so much expectations on your dad. He has dementia. Yeah, so I think one of the very important advice would be that uh, if you really suspect that something is wrong, it's good to get early diagnosis because rather than leaving a question mark and hanging like you're not sure what's going on, uh, although there is nothing that absolutely cures dementia, but it's, uh, there are services and help out there and also having a, thing, a question answered will help you be able to move on yeah, to see what's the next step. For those before they are really confirmed they have dementia, uh, I've been to the geriatric, I've got my mom to the geriatric. They're doing a simple test on uh, question, question and answer. But uh, is that good enough for me or should I go to AD? MRI is the best. You have to do an MRI. Yes, they were going to be doing an MRI scan on her brain and then to determine whether it has shrunk or other reasons. 
So, but that's yet to come. But what I'm asking is this. Uh, you mentioned it's very hard to maneuver yourself amongst so many associations, so many societies, and, and there's no one-stop center to help you. So for people like me who's starting to appreciate dementia, what can I do? Who can I really look at? Uh, other than right now it's only geriatric uh, at the Changi Hospital, but I'm not sure are they the, the one-stop for me? Even though I know a lot of other healthcare professionals, I found that GRM was the best place to actually find out because um, as a geriatric doctor, there could be a lot of different things that look quite similar and then you have to run a series of blood tests and things to rule out. Um, questions is actually just one of the things that the doctors will look at. To make the formal diagnosis, they still have to look at functional impact, like uh, what has it impacted and if there's any other thing underlying. So I would say that um, if you are actually already with a geriatric department, it's actually uh, good enough. Yeah, but what may help you is that um, you have to collect more evidence. So like for my dad, uh, when I visited the doctor, um, if let's say it was just my mom reporting, she would have left out a lot of details. Whereas for me, I know that there's a lot of things that I find abnormal. So I will record them down, make sure I write out a list and bring it to the doctor. Yeah, and also when I'm analysing what went wrong, I have to think of what's the possible cause. Yeah, and uh, analyze it with a friend and if it really sounded abnormal then I'll bring it up so um, whether it's before diagnosis or after diagnosis it's very important to keep a record of what are the things that is not very normal because some of the things uh, could be helped with medications some may not but uh, those that medications cannot help you can possibly find out the reason and tackle the reason all right we have time for two final questions I think there's there was one question there and Eleanor uh, Especially when you have an early detection, you know, if you are under 65, even if you have chronic diseases, you know, you cannot use your MedicSafe. And, or, you know, for Alzheimer's disease, for example, the medication is quite expensive and there is no government subsidy and nobody has brought up, you know, the, uh, this medical cost issue. Maybe, can you share with us? Because my dad has dementia at 53, so he reached um, intermediate stage. We will claim his insurance, his DBS insurance, to cover for his nursing home costs. So for us, um, uh, thankfully he didn't need a lot of medication, but for the medication he's on, we actually had funding from Tan Tok Seng itself. Yeah, so there are funding available. Just, yeah, there's funding available. I forgot the name of the scheme. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yes, we took funding from Tan Tok Sing. <laughs> so now you heard it here, right? There's funding from Tan Tok Sing. But not, your not exactly sure what, but yeah, there is. Go to the website, okay? Income has to be low or something. Yeah, there's funding um, that you can deduct from the medicine. It's not openly told to you. Raise the issue with the doctor. Ask them what scheme is available. The doctor can help you. But sir, thank you for that question. That could be a potential gap in, in knowledge, right? In which we can share more uh, with everyone along the way. Uh, we've got one final question right at the front. I've attended quite a lot of um, conferences, right, and, and events. And one of the, the things I've heard recently was a bit alarming for me when someone said to me uh, that I went, what I heard was um, one guy didn't want to reveal that he, 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 uh, he caregives his father um, to any of his colleagues or any of his um, or work people um, because of repercussions. So a lot of people don't want to reveal things about um, uh, maybe their family has dementia because of work related, because of some repercussions or whatever it is. Do you feel that you have faced some repercussions in some way or you don't reveal so much details at work? What's the reason? I'm just curious about that, you know, whether that exists. Thank you, great question. Yeah, perhaps ha have you needed to take more time off work to take care of, of him or has it affected you professionally in any way? Um, the thing is, I'm a self-employed, so my timing is flexible. So I'll try to cater to all the medical appointments. So in a way, my dad is more fortunate than other dads, I guess. <laughs> So I'm not afraid to tell people that my dad has dementia. I don't think it's something that is shameful of. Yeah, so um, and the thing is, if I tell people that he has dementia, so people will tend to care for him, show more patience for him, give him more time to speak whatever that is on his mind. 
Instead of everybody start saying, hey, I think your dad is a bit weird. No, why not you just tell them my dad has dementia? Be patient to him. Yeah. Uh, for me, I, as in, I don't go around and share with my colleagues that my dad has dementia. La. But um, like for my bosses, yeah, actually I will share with them. Yeah, so far there hasn't been a uh, too great bad impact that I know of. Yeah, but uh, for my like, uh, I would encourage my mom to actually share like, for example, in our uh, temple because uh, like, uh, for example, there will be sometimes that he needs help to go to the toilet, and after I shared with um, uh, somebody, then somebody will be there to help. Yeah, when he needs it, or like they find him trying to cross the road but it's too dangerous, so they will stop him from doing it. So there has been benefits of uh, sharing with them. Yeah, but of course there are also sometimes, um, it's not about not sharing, but it's after the sharing how the public reacts. Because not everyone understands dementia, so sometimes uh, they will ask, like, they'll openly ask my dad, oh, so your memory is very bad, so you got dementia, huh? Then, <laughs> then I'll be like, okay, then, yeah, so um, I think there's a lot we can do to educate uh, the attitudes, lah. how should you face or what are the appropriate questions to ask the dementia person, yes. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for the two ladies.